All right, so you have your note packet again. This is the same unit. We're still talking about the unity of life, and um, we're going to talk here in this unit about basically cells and their organelles. Um, there will be a fair amount of overlap from what we covered in seventh grade. You know, in seventh grade, we talked about many of the organelles. We talked about some basic functions. Um, we'll get into some more of the details um, this year. All right, so we know cells um, are what make up all living things, come from other living cells. So we're going to talk a little bit about cell theory today. We'll read a little bit about the history of cell theory as well. Um, but there's various types of cells, and they come in different shapes and sizes. They have different functions, and we'll talk about a little there. So the ideas that we have about cells and about um, where they come from and so forth. We call that cell theory. And we'll talk a little bit about the history of cell theory. I want to show you a video uh, here in a minute. Newton said, well, he's 
does not like that. Linda. It sparked a tense relationship between the two that lasted even after Hook died. As quite a bit of Hook's research, as well as his only portrait, was his case via Newton. Much of it was rediscovered, thankfully, after Newton's time, but not his portrait, as sadly no one knows what Robert Hook looked like. Fast forward to the 1800s, where two German scientists discovered something that today we might find rather obvious, but helped tie together what we now know as the cell theory. The first scientist was Matthias Schleiden, a botanist who loved to study plants under a microscope. From his years of studying different plant species, it finally dawned on him that every single plant he had looked at were all made of cells. At the same time, on the other end of Germany was Theodore Schwann, a scientist who not only studied slides of animal cells under the microscope and got a special type of nerve cell named after him, but also invented rebreathers for firefighters and had a kicking pair of sideburns. After studying animal cells for a while, he too came to the conclusion that all animals were made of cells. Immediately, he reached out via snail mail, as Twitter had yet to be invented, to other scientists working in the same field that was sliding it got back to him and the two started working on the beginnings of the cell theory. A bone of contention arose between them as for the last part of the cell theory, that cells come from pre-existing cells, Schleiden didn't exactly subscribe to that thought, as he swore cells came from pre-cell formation, where they just kind of spontaneously crystallized into existence. That's when another scientist named Rudolf Virchow stepped in with research showing that cells did come from other cells. Research that was actually, how to put it, borrowed without permission from a Jewish scientist by the name of Robert Renek, which led to two more feuding scientists. Thus, from teeth gum to torquing off Newton, crystallization to swarm cells, the cell theory came to be an important part of biology today. Some things we know about science today may seem boring, but how we came to know them is incredibly fascinating. So if something bores you, dig deeper. It's probably got a really weird story behind it somewhere. Wait, so nobody has a picture of the... I guess not. I don't know. I thought. Well, how do they know what he yeah. somehow looked like to put him in there? Yeah, I think there. I don't know. I thought there were pictures, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Switch it up. All right. Okay. So, <laughs> let's just talk about an overview of how we learned about cells. So again, it was really not until the advent of microscopes that made it easier for scientists to study cells because cells are microscopic and to see their structures, you need a microscope, and so. Um, many of the first pioneers of cell theory started as microscope uh, makers. And um, Stephen Hook was one of those, as we saw. He invented pretty powerful microscopes, had very uh, had unique ways of creating lenses that gave him excellent magnification. So he uh, was able to see cells, living cells. He looked at um, blood, he looked at sperm, he looked at pond water. And he saw that these were all contained living cells um, and worked also with Robert Hooke. He used the compound microscope, came up with the term cell, published a, a book. Oh, here's a leaving hook. Um, Robert Hooke, he uh, coined the term cell. He also published a, um, a book that included a bunch of his drawings called Micrographia, 1665. Okay. Robert Brown was the, the gentleman who is um, credited with discovering the nucleus within the cell. As he looked at cells in the microscope, he noticed that they almost all had a very small, dense structure. And so that was the nucleus. And then we get to Schleiden and Schwann, um, who were, botanists and zoologists who studied and started to really put together the main ideas of cell theory, that all living organisms are made of cells, cells are the basic unit of life. Um, and then eventually, so we have uh, Schleiden. Schwann. And then Verkau. Okay. And uh, Verkau was the person that um, solidified the idea that cells only come from other cells. There were other ideas at the time, but 
those are the beginnings of what we call cell theory. Okay? In cell theory, you know, you can phrase these, these things in various ways. But basically, it comes down to, first off, cells are the basic unit of structure and function of all organisms. No matter what living organisms you are studying, they are all made of cells. Whether it's a single cell amoeba, or a bacteria, or a redwood tree, or a mushroom, or a, a grizzly bear, all of those things are composed of one or more cells. Each of those cells carries on the life functions, the life processes, they use energy, they produce synthesize compounds and digest compounds. And these cells, new cells, only come from pre-existing cells, new cells reproduction. Now there are sort of some kind of exceptions. If we say new cells only arise from existing cells, well, that brings us to the inevitable question of, well, then where did the first cell come from? Okay, and as we studied in our last section, um, a heterotroph hypothesis and ideas about the origins of life on Earth, um, where you have first organic molecules formed, and then eventually self-assembling molecules, and um, so forth. So that is sort of an exception. Viruses, you know, viruses are technically not cells, although they do contain genetic material. They can reproduce if they are inside of a host cell. Um, so they're sort of straddling that that living non-living concept. And also, there are some organelles within a cell that actually have their own DNA and can reproduce on their own and replicate. They are the mitochondria and the chloroplast. Why do they have their own DNA? Why are these can these organelles within a cell replicate? They they produce the energy. Well, they they do. The, the chloroplast produces glucose, and the mitochondria releases ATP. But that's not quite why they have their own DNA. Brandon, because they were from other cells. Yeah, that if you remember back to what we talked about on the heterotroph hypothesis and evolution of life is that the mitochondria and chloroplasts were um, autotrophic and uh, autotrophic single cell prokaryotes that were engulfed by other cells and incorporated, that's that endosymbiotic theory, that the origin of some of these organelles is that they were formerly their own um, prokaryotes, which were ingested into um, other cells. So they have an origin there, and that's why they have their own DNA, and they can replicate themselves. So we know cells are sort of the basic unit of life, that all living things are made of cells, and the cell is the smallest living thing. There are things within cells, like organelles, but an organelle on its own is not a living, uh, it's not self-sufficient. Cells are the most basic unit of life, and cells are made of, you know, assemblage of molecules, Okay, to form cells like a single smooth muscle cell. This is one cell. In some living organisms, that's all. They, they have cells, they're made of a cell, and that's it. They have no more complex level of organization. But in some organisms, there is a more complex level of organization. These cells, these individual cells, work together to form tissue. Tissue such as smooth muscle tissue. Some organisms stop there. They have tissues, but they, those tissues don't form the next step, which are organs. You know, various tissues, like smooth muscle tissue, epithelial tissue, um, form organs, like the stomach. Okay. And then again, you know, we have sometimes several organs working together to fulfill a purpose. And we call that the organ system, or the system level of organization. And then 
these organ systems working together can form a complex organism. But not all organisms have each of these levels of organization. It depends on the complexity. We're going to be talking about various organelles, and as we do, we'll know that some of these organelles are found in plant cells, some in animal cells, some in both. So when we talk about sort of a generalized plant or animal cell, there's some important differences. Plant cells have some organelles that animal cells do not. They have a cell wall. They have chloroplasts. Um, now, when we say plant cell, animal cells, that's a huge generalization because there's lots of different types of living things. What about a fungi? Or what about bacteria? So these are just sort of all overall comparing animal and plant cells. Um, so they have those organelles. They also have vacuoles. They have a large central vacuole, which gives support and shape to the plant cell, whereas animals have generally smaller, very small vacuoles. There's another organelle called the centriole, um, and they are usually present in animal cells, but not plant cells. The shape of the cells varies because the outer layer of an animal cell is a cell membrane that's flexible. The, the shape of an animal cell can vary quite a bit, whereas most plant cells have a sort of rigid shape due to their external cell wall, which is made of cellulose. And then lysosomes are generally present in animal cells, but not plant cells. And we see differences in, um, between the two in terms of shape and other things. So let's talk about some of these organelles for today. Um, starting with the plasma membrane, also called cell membrane. It's the same thing, just two different terms. And the cell membrane, the plasma membrane, is the outer living layer of all cells. Okay. One important factor is that it is selectively permeable, which means what? Selectively permeable. What does that term mean? So it lets some things in and others not. Yeah, that it is responsible for um, the trans for all the materials from inside the cell to outside and vice versa. Okay? So that things that are going to go into the cell must pass through the cell membrane, and things that are leaving the cell must go out of the cell membrane. Okay? The structure is pretty interesting. The structure of um, the plasma membrane is called a phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so what the heck does that mean? Phospho, sound at all familiar? Phosphorus has a phosphorus-based head. That's this round part. Lipid. Do you know what a lipid is? Lipid is protein. Not protein. It's another big group of nutrients. So it's carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Lipid is a fat. And so phospholipid has these blue parts here, that's the phosphorus part. Those are the heads. Then they have a double a tail. They have two tails for each of those phosphorus. Those are the lipids. Okay? And because of the chemical characteristics of phospholipids, the phosphorus head is hydrophilic. The lipid tails are hydrophobic, which means what? What is hydrophobic? That's one you can figure out. Yes, afraid of water. It means. it means they don't, it's a lipid, so which makes sense. Fats and, um, and water do not mix well, okay? So what is hydrophilic? Yeah, water loving. And so what happens is the phosphorus heads, the water loving heads face out towards the environment, okay, which is usually liquidy and the tails face each other, sort of suctioning themselves off from that water, so they're away from it, and it forms a bilayer. What is a bilayer? A layer of two. A layer of two. So we have those two layers of phospholipids, and that creates the cell membrane. So here's the outside of the cell, here's the inside of the cell. Here's the me cell membrane, that phospholipid, but it's not you know, a two-dimensional layer. It has some three-dimensionality, has that area in between, um, also, it has embedded within it various 
other molecules, proteins, like these channel proteins, okay? Um, receptor molecules, um, glycoproteins, carbohydrate tails poking out here. So it has all this stuff sort of embedded within the phospholipid bilayer. Kind of carbohydrates on the outside. Also important is that it has uh, receptor molecules. Receptor molecules are these um, molecules, proteins that are poking on the outside of this plasma membrane, sort of listening for a signal. They have a very specific shape that matches up with another molecule, a hormone, or, um, or um, some other molecule, signaling molecule, that can send a message from one cell to another. These receptor molecules, you can think of it as listening for a signal from somewhere else. Okay? For example, what is a hormone produced in the pancreas? Insulin. Insulin. Insulin goes through <coughs> someone's bloodstream. Okay? And when it has a very specific shape, an insulin molecule, its shape matches with a receptor molecule on the outside of the plasma membrane for cells. When the insulin molecule connects with the receptor molecule of those cells, it sends a signal to them, causing something to happen, causing them to take in glucose. And that's how insulin works. It's a, a specific shape that matches with the receptor molecule on the outside of the cell membrane and tells that cell to send a message, bring in some glucose. So lots of things go into and out of the cell, all sorts of things. And some things the cell membrane is permeable to. These things can just diffuse in and out. Usually small molecules, water, oxygen, carbon dioxide. They can go through the cell membrane sort of as if it's not there, through diffusion. But many, most molecules, we should say, um, cannot just go right through the cell membrane. And they need to move from one side to the other in various ways. Sometimes there are these channel proteins, sort of a little tunnel through the cell membrane that allows certain molecules to move through it. Okay. Sometimes external material can be ingested into the cell through a couple types of um, active transport, penocytosis and phagocytosis. Penocytosis is when a small molecule sort of comes into the cell, forms a little pouch, and then that pouch pinches off and is then inside of the cell. Phagocytosis is how an amoeba eats, basically surrounds molecules and engulfs them until they're inside of the cell. This is an electron micrograph showing the cell membrane, obviously this thin layer. And this is those examples I just talked about. So here we have our cell is sort of on the top. Okay. I'm, so, I'm sorry, the cell is on the bottom, this white area. We have the extracellular environment with some molecules in it. This is an example, this is phagocytosis, where pseudopods surround something, they eventually connect around the outside and engulf it. And so now this food molecule, so let's say if that's what it was, is actually inside of the cell, inside of a little vacuole. If this was going to be digested, then a lysosome could come and fuse with it and start breaking it down. So that's phagocytosis. Penocytosis is sort of the opposite, a pinching in. Okay, where some of the extracellular fluid sort of pinches in, the membrane forms around it, eventually connects, and then it is inside of the cell here. Now this one is um, not selective. It's basically just taking in a little sample of the extracellular fluid and getting whatever's in there into the cell. There's also a type of endocytosis, taking in molecules, called receptor-mediated endocytosis, where there are these receptor molecules, and only after a molecule connects with that receptor molecule, then this endocytosis, penocytosis, starts to take place. So this can be more selectively taken certain molecules. The cytoplasm fills up most of the cell, okay? Sort of a fluid. Transport substances, it suspends the organelles. Chemical reactions take place within the cytoplasm. It's mostly water, 
with the addition of proteins and fats and carbs and other things. And it moves. It, it does, it's not, I know sometimes I, I describe it like as in jello with chunks of fruit stuck in it, but it's not like fixed like jello. It actually is a more fluid, um, so it can move. And you can see here, this shows some cytoplasmic streaming. Anyone, when you saw the amoeba, if you saw a living amoeba, if you saw the cytoplasm kind of oozing around, it moves. Here you can see um, cyclosis in um, some LOD. And you can see that these are the chloroplasts within the cytoplasm, and it moves around. Okay, those, those chloroplasts can move. Here again, here's just a microscope image showing the white area in this is the cytoplasm, and this is the cell membrane, and this is the nucleus. All right, I don't need to see two minutes of cycles. Um, let's let's hold off on our nucleus until tomorrow, because uh, I have an article on to read. Is, do you have your picture right now? Oh, let's wait till it, let's get the article. Yes, good idea.